Mahalo everyone for joining us today. Really excited. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce Compassionate Koala Poco to all of you. For those of you who've been here before, you heard uh, me say this, uh, but for those of you who are new, um, may I please uh, introduce our, our initiative. Compassionate Koala Poco is a collaborative founded by partners representing the Castle, Kalua, and Kalaiho complexes of the Hawaii Department of Education, Windward Community College, and the Harrow KL Castle Foundation. The Compassionate Koala Poco Steering Committee began meeting during the fall of 2019 with a shared purpose of helping Koala Poco, <coughs> excuse me, become trauma-informed and better able to support youth and their families. Formed with guidance from its advisory committee, Compassionate Koala Poco's mission is to foster a culture of caring. In other words, we aim to cultivate a flourishing, thriving Koala Poco, where the youth and their families are resilient and compassionate so that they can take care of themselves and others. We accomplish this by ensuring our school committees are trauma-informed and responsive. Today's speaker series is one of several initiatives funded through generous support from the Novo Foundation, Education First, the Rockefeller Foundation, and La Le Aloha Foundation to help in this effort. Um, I just want to say mahalo to Paula Morelli, who's, joined, who's on the speaker panel. Panel. She was also instrumented, instrumental in the founding of Kafasha Koala Poco um, as a member of our steering committee. So mahalo, Paula, for sharing your EK today with us. Mahalo, Derek. Thank you so much for giving us that background. And, and definitely mahalo to all of you that are spending time with us um, today, particularly our four special guests. And um, I was telling them earlier, I'm just like so amazed the planets align and they're all here. So I get the pleasure of introducing two of our special guests um, this afternoon. So um, I just like to um, mahalo Paula. Uh, and Paula, this is, I hope this is okay that I, I'm going to share a little bit about, about your um, bio. She is the third ger generation descendant of Filipino, Spanish, um, and Japanese immigrant settlers born in Chicago, but resided both on Oahu and the island of Molokai. Um, her parents were actually incarcerated in World War II um, at Heart Mount Wyoming concentration camp for Japanese Americans. And you know, as a woman of color and working with indigenous and minority communities, she formed a basis of this long life commit long lifelong commitment towards social justice. Um, and that is how um, I got to know her. Uh, Gail was sharing a little bit about that. Uh, she and her husband, Tom, uh, who is a psychiatrist, uh, were honored to provide behavioral health services in Los Angeles, Seattle, Kauai, and Oahu. She is currently retired from the University of Hawaii, um, Myron B. Thompson School of Social Work. Uh, and it says here that became Hawaii's program director at the Consuelo Foundation up until 2022, but she is busy. <laughs> She's doing a lot of other things, um, like being independent researcher, contracted by University of Hawaii, work with um, Overdose to Action Centers for Disease Control and Prevention Grant, um, which is around the misuse, abuse, and overdose, uh, overdosing of opioids, but the prevention strategies for state and local levels. And then I love this part because she puts in there that relationships with family, friends, meditation, making art, growing food, cooking and swimming are essential for her to do all of these wonderful things. It keeps her balanced. Um, the second person that you will hear from, so mahalo Paula, um, is Kumu Mikiala Lindstone. Um, she is born in Nanakuli, raised uh, in Kailua on this island of Oahu. And I know, you know, her being, her ano is about place. And so today she lives in Kapole, not too far from where she was raised in Nanakuli. And I love this part of her story is that in 2014, by the the um the prompting of the community, they begged her to extend um her expertise from just the classroom out. And so she is the founder um, of the Uluwa'e Learning Center, whose mission is to empower and enrich lives through culture and place-based programs that develop skills, build confidence, promote healthy relationships based on Ike Kupuna, Ike Hawaii, Hawaiian customs and values. And so um, she has been a teacher at Kapole High School and also a Kumuhula with Halau o Kaulu Lawa'e. I hope I said that correctly. Um, and definitely has now expanded this reach. And I was able, we were able to um, meet some of her haumana and 
and hear her story. And you guys are going to get to to do that uh, in this Eva Moku, where she's committed to place-based education. And I love this. This is what she says, if it's okay, if I quote you, that she believes that all Kiki and youth, and really all of us, should have an endless opportunity to grow our relationship with the place that we live in. So I welcome these two, um, Wahine, to our space. I'm going to turn it over to um, Gail, and she's going to introduce our Kane. <laughs> Thank you, Bella. Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so I have the pleasure of introducing Brandon Ledward and Dr. Patrick Uchigaki Uchi. So um, Dr. Ledward is of Kamehameha Schools, born and raised in Kailua, Oahu. Brandon now resides with his wife and three young children in Kapolei. A graduate of the public school system, he went on to earn a, his um, MA and PhD in anthropology at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. As part of Kamehameha School's Strategy and Transformation Group, Brandon blends OEV intelligence, systems thinking, and foresight to strengthen and advance our Lahui. He is passionate about culture and Aina-based education, as well as Indigenous approaches to research and evaluation. Brandon re relies on his, on his ohana, surfing, and music for joy and inspiration. Welcome, Brandon. And I also have the honor of introducing Pat, um, Dr. Patrick Uchigaki Uchi. He will also be speaking with us today. He's of the University of, of Hawaii. Dr. Uchigaki Uchi trained as a clinical psychologist at the University of Hawaii at Manoa Psychology Department. His current area of work involves research aimed at developing and evaluating programs for youth, adults, and families experiencing behavioral, emotional, and social challenges from a cultural, developmental, and life course perspective. He has also been involved in researching, developing, and evaluating innovative programs and interventions that address health, mental health um, disparities experienced by our underserved and unserved populations. His aspiration is to eliminate health and mental health disparities through partnerships with individual advocates, community-based organizations and governmental agencies in developing comprehensive and sustainable interventions and support systems from a strength, gift-based and culturally responsive youth and family-centered approach. Welcome, thank you so much for being with us. We're gonna turn it over to all of you wonderful people. Thank you so much. Wow, mahalo Gail and Bella and Derek. We're so excited to be here um, and to be on this side of the lens, because many of us have been attending the speaker series um, and enjoying it as much as all of you. So um, yes, for us to be able to be um, sharing about Kukulu Kumuhana is a real honor. Um, and again, for myself, uh, no Kailua Mayao. I'm from Kailua. I'm a graduate of Kalaheo High School, and I'm so um, inspired by the work that you folks are doing for my home. And although I don't reside there anymore, deep, deep connection to Kailua um, and the Windward side and all the work that you folks are doing um, in our schools and our communities and with our families is so important. So again, mahalo for this time. Um, I get to kick us off, um, then you'll get to hear from um, Paula and, and Mickey and, and Patrick. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen uh, and we can get started. Sorry about that, I'm trying to get to my... Here we go. All right, so, Kukulu Kumahana. Um, we'll break down that, that phrase in a little bit, um, but we're really here to share um, a process and a journey uh, that we took with, um, with our community to really try to understand well-being from a Native Hawaiian point of view or through a Native Hawaiian lens. Um, and although it's myself and Kumu Miki and Paula and Patrick sharing with you today, we're part of a, a collective as well who have been spending maybe the, the last five or six years having conversations, um, trying to push radical and new ideas about well-being um, for our people in our communities. I just want to acknowledge um, some of the organizations that have been um, supporting this work Kamehameha Schools, the Leo Kalani Trust, Office of Hawaiian Affairs, Papa Ololo Kahi and Consuelo Foundation, um, and many, many others. But just know that as we share this work, there's um, a much bigger cast of folks who, um, who have been a part of this journey. Um, so, you know, I think it's a great fit with Compassionate Ko'olau Poko and Kukulu Kumuhana 
Um, because I think what we're after is, is the same thing. We're, we're after a thriving community. And at the center of that is thriving families um, and connections to place um, and to culture. So while we're talking about well-being through a native Hawaiian lens, just want to be clear from the, the, the get-go that everyone is entitled to well-being, right? And everyone, um, regardless of your ethnic or cultural background, um, well-being is important to us. And absolutely, these last few years in this pandemic has taught us that. Hopefully, we keep those lessons close um, and, and we don't return to some of the return to normal in some ways that um, I think have held us back. But while we'll talk about it today from our point of view as, as Native Hawaiians or allies, um, we also want to encourage you guys to think about your model of well-being, how this applies in your life. Um, and it's not at all meant to be prescriptive. So just saying that as, as an outfront. Um, so I know there's a lot of educators on the call, and this is our attempt to maybe provide, maybe not a rubric, but at least our learning objectives. So these are our hopes for today. Um, when, when we got together, we said, we have 90 minutes. How do we want people to feel? What do we want them to know? And maybe what do we want them to do as a result of this conversation? And so when it comes to feelings, we hope you guys feel inspired and connected and empowered. That again, well-being is something that we're all entitled to. It's a process. It's worth paying attention to. Um, and it's probably one of the things that when you tend to it, it will blossom in many other aspects of our lives. Um, what I want you to know is that this is just one framework and how you can use it is really up to you. So the possibilities are endless. It's a really customizable framework. And ultimately you can take it from whatever you hear from today and start working with it and develop it for your own purposes. Um, and then lastly, we hope that you guys will explore because there's so much more um, than we're able to share in this short time, you know, about Kukulukumuhana and about well-being. Um, but we hope that you will take some of these ideas and apply it, you know, maybe just to yourself or to your classroom or to your place of business or work. Um, it's really meant to inspire creative actions. So with that in mind, we hope that, you know, we'll check at the end of our presentation if we, we were able to accomplish some of these things. I want to start with an Olelo no Eyal because for us, um, or at least for me as a Native Hawaiian, I think it's really important to, to dwell in our Ike Kupuna. Um, the intelligence of our ancestors. And this is a familiar one. Mohala uh, ikavai kamaka o kapua, right? I think the poetic translation is unfolded are the leaves or the blossoms with the drops of rain. Um, but really, when you think about what that's explaining is that flowers don't blossom on, on their own. They require the combination of the right elements. So plants need to thrive um, or plants are able to thrive when the conditions are right. And people are a lot like plants. So when we think about well-being, we are actually trying purposely not to individualize it and think about it as just one person's idea of well-being. We're trying to understand that all of our well-being is sort of uh, the result of the context we're in. You know, the, the con are the conditions favorable in our lives and our communities to make us thrive? And that was a really important um, driving factor when we started to talk about kukulu fumuhanas because we looked at a lot of the the frameworks of well-being, a lot of them were, you know, focused on wealth and health, right? You know, if you if you make a certain income and have a certain lifespan, then you've got well-being. All that's important. It definitely is not the whole story. Um, so what we were really trying to drive home was the idea that let's take the lens and maybe zoom out a bit. When we talk about well-being, let's look at the community factors. Let's look at the history. Let's look at the first and the politics that really shape us um, in profound ways. So before we jump in further, I want to take a quick moment to ask you guys, what feeds your well-being? What are things that you do you know, on a daily or regular basis that helps you to thrive? And if you could go ahead and throw some ideas in the chat, um, what are some ways that you practice self-care that you invest in your own well-being? Exercise classes, the ocean, power naps, <laughs> food, yes, paddling, prayer, working out, playing music, reading, gardening, excellent walks, food, spending time with my besties, surfing, I'm with you, Brighton. Ah, constantly reflecting on my why. 
cooking and eating. These are great. So many of these things um, that you guys are listing, um, some of them you can do alone. Um, a lot of them you're doing it with others. Um, but a lot of those things rely on something, right? That the ocean being available to you or having books or having the leisure time to do the exercise. Um, and that's something that I know this group is really um, ma'atu or aware is that not everyone always has access to, to these sort of um, uh, assets in our community. Uh, so that's something that's important too when we think about our work is um, we should be fortunate to have access to those things um, but we also should be mindful of how do we create access for others um, so that they can experience well-being, because uh, that will truly, truly make all of our communities brighter. Thank you guys for the chat and sharing. So we want to take you back to kind of the beginning, and I mentioned this is about Native Hawaiian well-being. Um, and so one of the inspirational pieces that we had in this, this formation or this journey around Kukulukuan we were fortunate to work with Meliana Meyer, who had been um, partnering with a bunch of um, Native Hawaiian artists and created this beautiful mural. Um, it's called Ku'u Aina Aloha. It's this um, 20 foot long, six foot tall mural that um, was painted on both sides. And originally was commissioned to show like, um, you know, the, the positive aspects of Native Hawaiian culture and identity. And that's the piece on the top. Um, the artist was asked to reflect on what are the stories of inspiration and joy that really reflect Native Hawaiian well-being in full flight. And so they painted that side. What was really interesting is in that process, they had to kind of go individually and as a collective into spaces of, of, of their own trauma, to be quite honest. So while they were painting the, the, the bright side, the top side, they were wrestling with some, some of these, these bigger issues of injustice and, and oppression and, and racism and, and feelings of not being good enough. So they, they turned the mural over and they actually painted that bottom piece. So the reddish kind of cube, cubism looking one where the artists collaborating um, and really processing their grief and their trauma. And, and we brought this, um, this art piece into the conversation when we began talking about Kukulukumohana. It really is inspired from art. Um, and what it told us was that one, Native Hawaiian well-being is complex. It's a multifaceted story um, that it is a process of working through restoration while recognizing trauma, celebrating all the, the wonderful things, but not turning a blind eye to some of the ongoing um, oppressive actions and marginalization. So that became a really important cornerstone when we started to talk as um, researchers or clinicians or educators about well being was we want to tell the full story. And the sense was we don't have the tools or the language to, to work with it. So we have to create it for ourselves. Um, so I've been using this phrase, kukulu kumuhana. I haven't broken it down. I want to take a, a few minutes to kind of unpack it. Because uh, like any Olelo Hawaii, it has so much um, kauna and, and meaning behind it. Um, so kukulu, the word itself, um, could mean to, to build or pile up. Um, it, it's usually the, a structure. Um, kumu, many of us know that word um, as teacher, but it also means source of knowledge. It's the main stock of a plant or the basis. And hana, of course, means activity or work. Um, so when you put it together, it's sort of like building the foundation of our work um, is sort of one way to think about this. But some of you might be practitioners of ho'oponopono. Um, and if so, you kind of see kupulu kumuhana as an important step in that process. It's actually where the ohana gather and they pool their spiritual and creative um, powers to focus on an issue and bring resolution. And that's really kind of the, the, the lens that we were looking at this um, work is well-being deserves our attention, but it also deserves us to pool our collective talents, our collective interests and experiences um, as organizations and individuals to have a really deep conversation about well-being and, and to move the marker um, beyond just you know, simply talking about what's on the surface level. I wanted to get deeper. So kukulukumuhana, um, there's much more that could be said about it, but for our purposes, it's the metaphor of, of pooling our collective strengths, creating a firm foundation for us to do work. And this is, I'm gonna take us through uh, a walk down memory lane really quickly. <laughs> I mentioned that we've been doing this work for about five or six years. Um, one of the key moments was in 2017, um, we had a gathering and, and really mahalo, uh, Lumi Okalani Trust 
for sponsoring this event up at Kui Lima, Turtle Bay. Basically got 50 um, uh, evaluators, researchers, but community leaders, musicians, artists, um, and, and uh, Kupuna together, sequestered us away from, from town and said, you're gonna stay here for the weekend and we're gonna talk about well-being. At the end of it, we hope to have a new framework that we can all embrace because all of our missions, whether they're the different organizations we're a part of or even our personal missions, would be well served if we had a collective framework to talk about this, um, uh, talk about well-being in our families and communities. So that first gathering was really, um, really special. And you can see Paula in the front um, and you probably see some other familiar faces. I'll quickly say one story that, you know, the tagline for this was creating radical and new knowledge um, to advance Native Hawaiian well-being. And just a note, when you use the word radical in your invitation, radicals are going to show up, which is awesome. Um, so we had really lively conversations. And I think for some of us, you know, who work as research in research or evaluation, we're used to having kind of more of an academic discussion. But this is a, a now guts on the table, um, very like community participatory process where the participants were saying, I don't want to go in that direction. I think we want to go in this direction. Um, and so us as planners, we sort of had to let go. And, you know, for me as a surfer, it's like, you, you got to just go with the power of the ocean. Don't fight it. Um, and what was wonderful is even though we had some, some tense moments and some real um, honest and urgent conversations, we pukered through that with, I think, a really wonderful framework. Whereas I think if we tried to censor it or censor the conversations, I think we would have ended up, you know, not much different than where we started. Um, so there's a link here. And when you get the, the presentation, you can click into it. There's like a proceedings from that, that event. And, um, and you can learn about the, the way it was organized and, and what came through. Um, and what did come through was this framework of well-being that has six different dimensions, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, but a year later, uh, we got together and we said, you know what? 50 radicals was good. What if we double that? And so we asked participants to invite someone else that they knew um, that they felt would be benefit from hearing about Kukulukumuhana and also had some contribution to it. Um, and the goal from this gathering at Kaiva Ula and Bishop Museum was Let's take the framework, let's test it, and let's see if we can come up with some indicators and measures. Like, if we believe in these things, what would we see in ourselves, in our families, in our communities, if we're experiencing well being? Um, and this is a wonderful conversation, again, uh, super hot. We do it in summer out in um, Bishop Museum. So we were all sweating, but um, you can see some of the real important kupuna um, for us in the front row Betty Jenkins, um, you know, one kupuna just hollered recently. Um, but yeah, anti poor like these are folks who, who we just mahalo their, their sustained contribution. Um, and, and they really did this into, I think, new frontiers. Um, so that was 2018, I'm sorry. Um, and then just this past year, we're up at Kaiba Kilomoku, up on campus at Kamehameha schools and our numbers keep growing. And what's wonderful in the front row of this picture, you can see um, Nakeiki. And these are students of Kumu Miki's program who, who came and actually shared um, a, a mele uh, that they, they wrote based on Kupulu Kumuhana because they, they took the framework, they embraced it, and, um, and they were able to kind of share it back. So really exciting work. Just wanted to kind of share that this is a journey and that there's a lot of people that have been a part of, of creating this tool. Um, and we hope that you see yourselves in these pictures. Um, you're, you're part of this, this mass if you feel like this is a, a you know, a, a cause that, that's worth, worthy of your time, we welcome you to, to do this work. Um, I want to be really mindful of my time, so I'm going to go a little bit quicker so that we get to hear from some of the other folks. But um, so I've been talking about this framework, but yeah, Brandon, what is it? I don't, you keep saying this Kukulukumahana framework. So really, um, it's this idea of, of six different sort of, we call them dimensions or, or aspects of well being that are really overlapping. So sometimes we have to fight that tendency to think that, you know, when you have six things, that those six things are separate. But from an Oweevi uh, point of view or a Native Hawaiian point of view, we see these things as just different elements that maybe have a different season or a different um, trajectory, um, kind of like phases in a moon, perhaps. So they're always present um, and they, they definitely react with, with one another. But what we thought was really important in this framework is to acknowledge first and foremost, you know, if we're going to talk about Native Hawaiian well-being, it should be informed by Native Hawaiian values um, and olelo. 
So the six dimensions are, um, you know, Alala Hawaii, Hawaiian terms. They're, they're metaphors. They're very evocative, and I'll explain them in a bit. Um, I mentioned the fact that these are kind of six sides of the same coin. So this is a sense of it's a holistic view of well-being, that all these things are connected, that they provide us with um, a way of understanding all, all the gifts that we have, and sometimes things that might not be on the surface. If you look a little bit harder with this lens, you might be able to find gifts in yourself or your students or your coworkers. Um, Multidimensional, of course, we talked about that. And really, there's a, a social justice issue behind this. And I feel like this group, you know, with your work with trauma-informed care is really important to recognize that, you know, it's a political act, I think, to create a model of well-being um, and to really try to advance it because without, without doing much, it, it's, it is disrupting ideas about well-being, right? It's dislodging dominant narratives about what well-being should be or who gets to decide what well-being is. Um, so for us, it was really important to put this in the hands of community, have them define it. And that's why I say, now that we, we give this gift to you, you guys can define it and use it for your purposes as well. Uh, so I'm gonna go through each of these six dimensions so that you can get a little bit of a sense of it. And I think Gail, you mentioned that some folks on the call might've have got a copy of these cards or have seen these cards. Yes, some of our teachers do have some of these cards, and we can, we're can. we happy to get more out to them after this. Yeah, we've been passing want... them out and push, you know, like, not pushing nice. it, but you know what I mean, <laughs> promoting it, promoting it. <laughs> I, I think that's so fantastic. And again, I think part of it is literally getting this into the hands of people, right? Because it, it's not just something that you can, you know, think about. You have to really sit with it, work with it, process it. Um, but these cards, again, were something that the team came up with because, um, uh, Lilio Kalani Trust was having a what they call a youth eye huddle. So they actually gather youth to um, kind of crowdsource ideas of like, what would kind of programming would they like to see? What are the issues in their lives? What's going on? And they wanted to have a conversation about well-being. And we realized that, you know what, the way that we've been talking about it is pretty, pretty much like for adults, you know, We're like well-being is this model and you can use it and social justice. And um, so we stopped and said, if we're going to put it in the hands of, you know, 16 or 14 to 20, 20 year olds, how do we talk about well being? So, these cards are really a sense of like stripping down the language to some very, I think, um, basic concepts. And then we got playful by putting these superpowers because we talked about, you know, well being, um, you know, is, is sort of like a superpower. If, if you look at these different dimensions as, as um, assets that you can grow and shape and use, then we could make it kind of fun. So, so starting with AL, which is a really important word um, and, and concept that often is translated as sovereignty or self-determination. Um, but air also means life. It means breath. It's the process of respiration and breathing, right? So without air, like you do not live. Um, and the same way, like as an individual, but also as a community or as a family. Um, and there's also this sense of to rise or to, to, to go up or to raise something. So the dimension again, these were all defined by, by the, the groups that came together, was when we talk about well-being, we want to know where do we have agency in our lives? Where, where do we have authentic choice over what we can do? Um, where do I have influence um, over myself and over others? Uh, where can I make a difference, right? So in that dimension, if, you know, if people can, can share those kinds of examples or feel like, yeah, I, I'm empowered to do X or Y, then that's sort of a window into looking at Ea. Um, and like the card says, if when you have AI, it's going to help you to make good choices. You're going to be able to stand up for what's right. What's important is that it's not just influencing others, but it's it's serving them, serving others as well. So um, I know this is going to be really quick as I go through the six dimensions, but um, just think about in your life, and again, your classroom or, or your, your setting, your workplace, um, is AI important? Is that something when you talk about well-being that, that you bring to the table, that the people in your community have agency? They have a voice. They have choice. Um, a second dimension is aina momona. Um, and this is, again, a, a Hawaiian phrase that, that usually means, you know, plentiful or productive land. Aina momona is like, oh, it's cherry. When you got aina momona, you solid. And what's interesting about that is, you know, aina momona was the standard, you know, for our kupuna. Like the expectation was that you would make your land and people as productive as possible. Um, and so when you think about this dimension for us, it was what is the relationship between um, people and Aina? 
and, and, and how do we grow that? How do we sustain it? Um, how do we heal it if it needs to be healed? So some folks in our community have a gift at being able to, to work in that area. And I would suggest Kumu Mikiala is one of those um, who can really cultivate, identify, and build Aina Mamona in people and in communities. And when you have this, this asset or you have this framework, it really does help to keep you balanced. It gives you a respect and a value for nature. And you start to see hidden connections, you know, between, and this is true for our, our kupuna. We talk about, hey, you know what? When the sharks are biting, the vili vili tree is blossoming, right? Something happening in Malka and something happening in the Kai, our kupuna were able to see that connection. It wasn't a cause and effect connection. It was just the time of seasons. So when you're steeped in Aina um, and you have those relationships, you're more perceptive to that. And we want to develop that kinship. Um, a third dimension um, is pilina. And I think this one, we probably heard of this word a lot. The root word is pili, right? And so pilina means relationship or union. But to be pili to someone is to really to cling, to stick, like super glue kind, right? So if you have someone in your family, like maybe they're really pili to their grandmother or so-and-so's pili, like they're always going to be together. Um, that's kind of the image that we think about for, for pili. Um, and this dimension is really about recognizing and showing care and, and, um, and compassion to others. It's being able to really harness your emotions, um, not necessarily to, to command them, but to understand them and kind of work through them. And because you, you see connections between yourself, your family and communities, um, you're able to invest in those things. So if you're someone who has a lot of empathy, a lot of care and compassion, you probably have a strong sense of pilina. Um, and that's really important. Um, especially as we, we know that um, most of the change you want to see is going to require strong relationships. So Pilina is a third. Um, vai Vai was a fourth dimension. Um, and Vai Vai is, you know, the root word is Vai, fresh water, super important. Um, you would say for a lot of Indigenous people, but I would say with climate change and everything going on, Vai Vai or Vai will always be important. Um, and when you duplicate it to Vai Vai, it really does mean goods or property but it, it can translate to wealth, but it's a sort of a shared wealth because no one really owned Vi in a Hawaiian perspective. You had people who caretaked it, they stewarded it, made sure that it flowed for people, but you didn't really have private ownership of it. So when we think about this dimension, we think about, okay, so how do we tap into that notion of abundance from our ancestors and collective wealth and shared prosperity? Um, and when you have that kind of perspective, you're able to take chances, you can explore possibilities, um, you care for things that are, that are deeper, right? Not just financial um, and a strong sense of community. So Vai Vai was a really important piece um, to the puzzle. And the last two, and I'll get to pass off to, to Mikiala. Oivi was a, another dimension that kind of goes without saying. Oivi is another word for native Hawaiian or um, it literally means native or indigenous. The, the, the word Evi in there suggests that this means someone that's of the bone, so connected to a group. And when we talked about well-being, we said, again, for Native Hawaiians, it's really important, our cultural identity and our Native intelligence to see that as a strength. And in this world, maybe even a competitive advantage, right? As Indigenous people who can understand systems and, and, and maybe navigate through complexity. Um, so you could say the whole framework is around, about Oivi, um, but there's dimensions where, like, how, how, how connected do you feel to your people? What's your sense of pride? What are your cultural knowledge and practice? that you, you um, have obtained that you can share. Those are all things that I think are really important. Um, again, from a native Hawaiian perspective of well-being, and maybe this translates to others groups as well. And then the final one, and admittedly, we actually had five dimensions uh, on that 2017 uh, gathering. And then a kupuna stood up, it was Auntie Betty Jenkins and said, away, you are missing an important dimension. We cannot forget about Akua. And, Everyone kind of sat back and said, you're absolutely right. So Keokua Mana is really looking at the spiritual aspect of well-being. And from a Hawaiian point of view, it's this idea of the sacredness of mana, right? That you have power, that, that inanimate objects have power, that ancestors have power. Um, and essentially that if you can tap into that, that lets you see your place within a wider, um, a, a wider background. It's not just all about you. Um, and it does probably give you some principles, those who believe in a more formal higher power, but even those who just see um, spirituality as a source of strength for them. Um, that was something that we thought was really important 
to, to capture as well. So these six dimensions are basically maybe ways that you could think about well-being if we wanted to tell a story of well-being that Native Hawaiians would recognize um, from, from their, their traditions and, and their background. So I'm gonna stop really quick and just another chat poll and see like, I know this is fast, but from what you've heard, is there one of these dimensions that you feel kind of a resonance with? And, and maybe it's just today, like, hey, I feel like I've got Pilina in my life, or I feel like I got some five by. Go ahead and throw some ideas in the chat. Any of these six, one that either resonates with you or you're curious about? Keakua mana, yeah, Pilina. Yeah, you go, Gail. Yeah, Bella. Earl says all of them, fantastic. Oh, Weeby, yeah. So even within our group, and I know we got about 50 people on the call, you know, different ones, different ones that kind of resonate with us. And I would suggest too that, and, and you'll hear from Mickey and, and others how they've used this tool. Um, I think these dimensions will change, right? Given, given where we're at in our life and in any moment, we might feel a connection to one. We might feel like, ooh, I'm having a hard time uh, in this one aspect. And so in that sense, it's, it's basically, you know, a, a reflective tool. Um, it doesn't tell you that, you know, you have to be in these places all the time, but it's a healthy checkup to say like, hey, I know Mamona, what am I doing in terms of my relationship with my place and, and my Aina? And what can I do more? Um, so again, mahalo for, for doing the chat poll that really helps um, to see how you guys are connecting with this. Um, I'm going to pass off to Kumu Mikiala, who's going to share. Um, but Mickey, would you like me to show the video first or do you want to do a little voiceover before I, I hit play? Um, no, go ahead and, and share it first. That would be great. Okay, awesome. It'll Here's give us a little... chance to have everything sink in. That that was so that was so just by by all that you shared. So yeah. Awesome, awesome. And th this is a video that um uh Kumu Mickey brought her students to our Kukulu Kumuhana gathering this past year at Kaiba and and, and they did such an amazing job. So you'll hear the six dimensions, listen for them. You'll hear them actually chant and sing them. Um, and yeah, enjoy this. This is, was a big treat for us. so great. I love watching that every single time. And I was in there in the room. It was a chicken skin moment. So mahalo for that, Kumo Mickey. Oh, mahalo, Brandon. Um, and mahalo, I'll share a little bit about that as, as I go on. Um, mahalo for all that information on the six dimensions. Um, you know, when I, before I started the Uluwa'i Learning Center, I was running my halau for, for several years. And I opened my halau actually in 2004. And I remember the day I opened my halau, my kumuhula, Auntie Mae Klein, who's from Kaneohe, she gave me one piece of advice on this day. And I and it's the only thing I remember from the day that I opened my halau. And she said, she said, Mickey, you know, you're a kumu now. And you need to remember that being a kumu is about being gracious in the times that you are angry. And th I thought it was a strange piece of advice, but it wasn't until I failed at this advice several times that I realized how important it was to the well-being of my halal, to be able to handle the times in life that are challenging, especially as a kumuhula with youth that look up to you. About 10 years after I opened my halal, I began running Aina-based experiences with our programs at Uluwa'i Learning Center. And it was one day when we were in the lo'i that I 
learned that our kupuna had a freeze for the advice that Auntie May gave me 10 years prior. And that phrase is nani ke kalo. Nani ke kalo. Have you heard this phrase before? The first day I ever took my keiki, my students to the aloi, the farmer, the mahi ai Anthony Deleuze, told us that when you enter the lo'i, you always enter with the mindset of nani ke kalo. You may be feeling a little sick. You may be feeling a little apprehensive. You don't know what you're getting into. You may be feeling hot. You may be feeling hungry. You may not be having a good day. But when you enter the lo'i, you lift all that off your shoulders. And the only thing, the only thing in your mind is nani ke kalo. Beautiful is the kalo. This past summer, one of my eight-year-olds who's been to the lo'i over two dozen times with us, we were in the lo'i and we were stomping in and she stepped on a, on a sharp rock and it pierced her foot. And, and as soon as she stepped on it, a screeching ouch came out. And immediately all of us turned to her and she's hunched over in pain. And she looks at all of us and she's trying to hold back her cry and tears are welling up in her eyes. And she sees all of us looking at her and she whispers, Nani ke kalo. On the last day of our summer programming, this past summer with our keiki, we took about 23 keiki ages five to 10 to Kayona Beach on the east side to snorkel and identify limo in the ocean. And we were in the water for about an hour. And I, after about an hour, I start hearing sporadic cries of pain. And I'm noticing that our, our keiki are getting stung by jellyfish. And one by one, I, I tell them to start coming out of the water. And so as they're coming out of the water, I see them and they're caressing their sting. And some of them are crying, but they're trying not to cry too loud because they don't want to cause attention to the pain. And as they come out, they approach myself and each alaka'i holding the area with, of their sting with nani ke kalo. I was 35 years old when I learned nani ke kalo. The keiki I work with will live their entire lives knowing nani ke kalo. And that's powerful. And so when Paula and Peter introduced me to Kukulu Kumuhana, I knew right away that this would become part of the repertoire of our well-being strategies for our keiki. The six dimensions appealed to me right away because these elements are in what we do in our routines, our site visits, our conversations, our storytelling. And although they're in our hana and in in the work and the activities that they do, that we do, they weren't necessarily in our vocabulary. We weren't really using the term ea, but we practiced ea by being willing to try new things, by taking responsibility for our decisions and by making right choices. So I, want, I knew I wanted to start using the, these terms more intentionally to enter them into the consciousness of our haumana, because I already saw the power of nani ke kalo. So what could Ea do? Pilina, Aina Momona, Vaivai, Oivi, Keakua Mana. But I knew I couldn't start with my keiki if my staff were not accustomed to these terms. So I started with my Limahana, my team. And in our staff meetings, we would go around before every staff meeting and share which dimension is the strongest in our life at the moment. Is it Aina Momona that's strongest today? And we went around and we would share. And then after that, what dimension is, is not the strongest? And we would go around and share. And together as a staff, we came together in expressions of vulnerability and in expressions of strength as well. And as an employer, it was helpful for me to hear this because then I knew where I could support my team. Right now we're in the process of, of sharing kukulu kumuhana with, with our haumana, with our students, um, and also creating an inventory of daily routines that embrace these six dimensions. And we plan to share these out at the end of the summer. But, but daily routines that, that we do like piko, which aligns with keakua mana, we do piko every day, it's, it's, it's a, it's a daily routine for us. Our, our haumana leave their school campus. They come to our, our campus in Kalailoa after school, and we immediately go into Pico to center ourselves. That's Keokua Mana. 
Every week we care for Pu'o Kapolei. We care for other places, but Pu'o Kapolei is the one place we care for regularly every week. That's Aina Momona. Caring for that place inspires us to also care for, for ourselves, the place within ourselves and to be healthy. Pilina, we do this regularly by encouraging our Haumana to sit next to someone new every day. If you sat next to this person today, sit next to someone new today. And Ea, Ea, every time after, every day after homework, we have Hana no Eao stations and giving our Haumana the, the uh, power to choose which activity to do for the day. And perhaps it's not an activity. Perhaps it's lying under the tree and looking at the sky because that is what I need today, Kumu. And that's Ea. We do that every day. <laughs> and Oivi is our Ko'ihonua. We share our Ko'ihonua every day. I come from this mountain and this ocean and these breezes are part of my community and these rains. And that's where I come from. And I'm proud of that. And that's Oivi. Huh? And Vai Vai is so important. And, and I didn't see so many Vai Vai in the chat, but I think Vai Vai is, is strong for those of, us, those of us who use reusable water bottles who really reduce our use of single use plastics, who really think about the, the contributing to the abundance, the true abundance of, of our communities. And so, so much information was shared with Brandon, all of that, that was so great. I hope when we think about um, feel, think and do, I hope you feel ma to, to start applying kukulu kumuhana right off the bat, in the workplace, in the classroom, in your homes within yourself. And I hope you think of possibilities, just like Brandon shared in the very beginning. And I hope you do create, create ways of implementing kukulu kumuhana in your everyday lives. Um, we've created several mele and hula with kukulu kumuhana, like the one that you, you saw earlier in the video, because entering these uh, these phrase, these dimensions within the consciousness of our homeowners so they hear it. And mele and hula is the best way to reach our keiki. So it's in their minds, they're gonna see, they're gonna hear it regularly. And mele is such a great way to do that. And so I look forward to seeing kukulu kumuhana just alive in our different spaces. Mahalo nui. Mahalo to you, Mikiela, for sharing and for just taking you know, taking this framework and just diving head first um, with your Halmana. And it was a real gift at the um, at the conference or the gathering earlier this year to, to see that because, you know, I think some of the most powerful things, you know, I'm a, I'm a researcher, um, married to a, a teacher. So I, I respect, I'm a big fan of teachers. Um, but I, I, there's something different when, when the next generation embraces something like confidently and like, we got this, you know, it's sort of, it, it told me like, hey, I gotta get with it. You know, it's like the first time someone called me uncle, it was like, oh man, that was rough. But, um, but then you realize <laughs> like, okay, I gotta, I gotta watch what I do, you know, cause I, I have a kuleana and sometimes kids are the best vehicles to remind you of what your kuleana is. Um, so thank you for that gift. Um, Paula's gonna share, I'm gonna put up the, the deck again um, for Paula and then yeah. We'll invite her into this conversation. Well, I want to say mahalo, Mikiela, because our connection with you. Oh, sorry, sorry. You know, was was such a blessing, and uh, it was to be the hand of fate that said, "Let's go with." You know, I, I said, I'm going to take this to her. And Mikiela just ran with it. Um, her creativity, her love of the, the kids, uh, I tell you, it's um, remarkable. And I was, we were blessed to be there with her. And, and we're still. Um, now, I just wanted to begin by mahaloing everybody at Compassionate Ko'olau po Poco. Uh, Bella, Gail, Derek, you know, you folks are so critical to the ongoing sustainability of Compassionate Ko'olau Poco. And I wanna thank all of you out there 
teachers, of compassionate Ko'olau Poko, community members, parents, young people, for your courage and commitment to well-being of our children and to trauma-informed education. I've been honored to serve with your advisory group. And this kind of effort can grow in all communities throughout the state. Um, and this particular slide is basically, it basically acknowledges what you already know, that respecting and working within the context of valued indigenous ways of knowing is decolonizing and trauma-informed. You know, one of the things I was going to do is put the ACEs up there, the adverse uh, childhood experiences and social determinants of health. They all can work together and support the well being of our kids, you know, in theory. Um, but today I'm hoping to stimulate some thoughts and discussion about the connection between trauma and substance abuse. So I'm going to take a little left hand turn here. Um, and, and talk about that connection. Um, I think our youth or emerging adults who experience trauma may present, as you know, with difficult behaviors, acting out, non-compliant, defiant behaviors, missing or reluctant participation, yeah? Um, that kind of unspoken, unrecognized rage that can stem from intergenerational trauma, systemic racism, historic cultural trauma that can leave an individual at risk for poorer outcomes in body, mind, and spirit. So I just want to share that, you know, the National Institute of Justice studies the life stories of mass shootings. And they report the vast majority of mass shooters experience childhood trauma and exposure to violence at a young age. So when we look at the recent shooters in St. Louis, Missouri or Uvalde, Texas, that may be part of the profile we're looking at. And you know, and I know the pain and suffering of trauma can be self-mitigated in many ways. And substance use is one of those ways. I just wanna share that according to SAMHSA, Hawaii has an annual average of 93,000 persons aged 12 and older who used any type of illicit drug in the past year. And Hawaii's use substance use parallels national rates. But substance use for Native Hawaiian youth, Micronesian youth, and sex and gender minority youth are reported to be higher than other youth. So I'm very honored to be working at UH with their Overdose and Action Project, where I'm learning more about the complexities um, I think you probably know that in 2021, an unprecedented 100,000 people in the U.S. died by drug overdose. And between 1999 and 2020, 564,000 people died by overdose involving an opioid. So we're in an epidemic. But I want to bring this home. You probably heard recently uh, this story that happened in August of this year. Two boys, ages 15 and 16, ran into a Kalihi restaurant bar armed with a slingshot and assaulted a 60-year-old female customer and attempted to take her purse. Afterwards, when the boys were arrested, they found a methadone pipe in their possession. So I think you, you know, it's obvious we're in the midst of rising violent personal crime 
and the perpetuation of trauma. So I know you have a lot of questions. I, I'm, you know, I think that it's good to start somewhere in this discussion um, because there are a lot of complexities which limit and they limit prevention and intervention. But I believe we can learn more about these complexity complexities by engaging youth, families, and communities through the strength-based approach of Kukulu Kumuhana well-being dimensions. One final thought. You know, I was just reading today that the international cocaine producing countries are beginning to address this drug problem with decriminalization. In the West, in the United States, not so much, but Oregon State, as you probably know, decriminalized possession of all drugs, including cocaine. So my thinking is, Ultimately, well-being is the kuleana of communities. Thank Mahalo you. Mahalo for that, um, Paula. Yeah, I mean, again, part of this right process is not turning a blind eye to the realities on the ground and to really, you know, look at, you know, this as a, a community issue, not an individual issue, right? Like, what were the conditions and, and how do we, how do we rise up? I want to invite um, Patrick into the conversation now, because um, you kind of heard through Mickey the application of Kupulu Kumahana, you know, in her program. Um, some of you on the call may be uh, administrators or grant writers. Um, so yeah, Patrick, you can kind of share your experience of Kupulu Kumahana and how you've been uh, using it. Okay, thanks, Brendan, and. Thank you to Gail and Bella and Compassionate Ko'o Lao Poko for um, allowing us to uh, do this presentation. And I was asked to be a part of the presenters uh, uh, to give some examples of how Kukulu Kumuhana uh, provides such a uh, wonderful opportunity for um, really addressing issues of well-being for Native Hawaiians and for actually for our whole population. Um, and I, so there's two examples, but I, actually Miki Ala gave such a great example of the application of Kukuru Kumuhana. And so in my first slide, actually it, it's also what Miki Ala shared is also a good example of the work that still is ahead of us. So, not for me as a researcher, um, well, number one, you know, uh, I spent the first 10 years of my career um, teaching and providing consulting and uh, counseling services for um, programs that address um, youth with behavioral, emotional, substance abuse problems. And I was teaching, you know, what we studied uh, in our program, which is primarily evidence-based practices that have been developed, you know, in the United States um, on primarily um, white and African-American uh, populations. And um, that was my job. And about 10 years into my um, career, uh, one of my projects was to uh, work with the women's prison to implement a trauma-informed system of care. The warden had this vision of uh, what was really needed for the people that he was caring for in his facility. And it was not punishment and incarceration, it was healing and the ability to re-enter back into the community uh, as a healthy human being with supportive relationships and knowledge about how to develop those relationships. Uh, as well as develop themselves. And I also then out of that project uh, had an opportunity to work with Antipua uh, Burgess, who um, really changed uh, my, my point of view, I guess, is probably the simplest, most simplistic way of, of explaining what happened. It, it actually just, for, it, I'm empirically based and I saw what she was doing. And I, there was a, 
kind of a light bulb that went off that this is something that I don't know anything about. She was practicing her building a beloved community based on Hawaiian cultural values and practices, as well as her own experience as a um, uh, facilitator um, in creating peaceful communities. And I was fortunate to sit in with her sessions with the women. And it just um, uh, amazed me in the response that she was able to, and the relationship that she was able to establish uh, with the women who, from, my, from our, my clinical perspective, they would be considered treatment resistant, um, non-compliant, uh, hard to treat. Um, and they were amazing in the work that they did to develop, they led the development of a trauma-informed uh, program for assisting women for the coming into the prison from the first minute that they step into the prison. How can they be helped to feel safe, to feel supported, and to have hope for what lies ahead? And I thought to myself, okay, I, I need to understand better uh, what Antipua is doing. And the other program that I was evaluating in the prison was the warden had developed uh, um, a lo'i and that he had one of his um, uh, guards who was actually trained to be a Native Hawaiian healer to supervise about 15 women uh, that he felt were appropriate for that type of intervention. And so, because I didn't really understand what that intervention was about, I decided I needed to uh, attend all of the sessions. And I, I sat in the lo'i and pulled weeds with everybody else, and then sat under the mango tree and shared stories about what their experience was in the program and actually what got them into the prison. And again, exactly what Miki Allah was describing, but for a different group of people, but there were certain principles that were represented you know, in, in the work. Uh, and it really, well, number one, it really helped me to see what the, uh, I'm just going to say, give the English translation as best as I can, but uh, the learning is in the work. And by being in the lo'i, that, uh, that was the beginning of a healing process for the women. And being under the mango tree and then sharing your stories with empath empathic listeners who have been through the same experiences was the second part, the second step of their healing. And I, that put me on a different track of how to understand then we, to replicate, to re document and then replicate uh, that type of intervention for uh, individuals experiencing extremely challenging life experiences. So, um, well, number one, what Mikiala shared is just so valuable. But my first bullet point is that we don't have enough documentation and data to show how well uh, programs uh, oh. designed on Native Hawaiian cultural values and practices, how valuable and effective that can be. We have a lot of, we have, I, I think, so we have, a, we do have a lot of data, but the data is held uh, in the programs. And we don't have a good way for us to be able to collect the data, share it, uh, and have it established uh, as a, a viable best practice from the perspective of the funders, from the perspective of the scientists. So having Kukulukumohana, which is a framework developed by cultural experts 
through a culturally appropriate rigorous process that we can now say we have an evidence-based practice kukulukumohana, that can be utilized to develop treatment and prevention programs. The second, so it doesn't, so we can collect data now because we now have a framework to collect data. We have a ability to establish what could be a best practice from a cultural perspective. And we have the ability now by collecting data from these programs so that we can then share results because we're collecting common data on the six dimensions that can be shared and compared across programs. And so for, from a research perspective, those are extremely valuable um, resources to then present grant applications, to develop program activities, and to document the impact and effectiveness of programs by using frameworks such as Kukulukumohana. So I will give a couple of examples of that. So Brandon, if we can see the next slide. Okay, so I'm gonna share two studies. Um, one is a research study, which is this first one. And then the second one would be uh, a, a culture-based uh, program for families. So this, I put this up as an example. So on the, on the left column, major advances in current multidisciplinary research approaches. So this research project, I was contracted to um, uh, describe the youth who have been sent to Hawaii Youth Correctional Facility for from 2014 to 2019. Uh, juvenile justice is going through re a major reform and we needed to understand better who was now being sent to HYCF so that we could develop appropriate programs for them. And so in, in using best practices in terms of how do we describe the youth, the, these on the left side, developmental neuroscience, criminology, social and behavior sciences, these are the areas that in uh, an assessment of the youth, these are the domains that we document by looking at their files. So in terms of developmental neuroscience, there's a lot of great research now that shows brain development that uh, occurs for a longer period of time than what we previously thought. So important um, capacities, including um, uh, problem solving, being able to plan for the future, and managing and self-regulation, self-regulating your behavior and your emotions are not fully developed until your early 20s. And so we need to think about that when we do assessments in terms of where are the challenges and how can we explain that from a developmental neuroscience perspective? And then how can we develop interventions that help to support development, uh, neuroscience, uh, neurological development in these particular areas? Uh, from a criminal, <clears throat> criminological uh, discipline perspective, we want to look at their developmental life course history of criminal offending. We want to look at the evidence-based, research-based risk and protective factors that, that, especially the risk factors that got them into juvenile offending. And what were, what were the uh, research in terms of factors that led to desistance or stopping your criminal behavior and understanding where was the youth at in terms of this desistance process. And then we have trauma, understanding the effects of trauma, restorative justice, looking at that as a possible um, intervention, uh, and the social determinants, the environmental factors that contribute to criminal offending. And so that would be a standard evidence-based assessment of who is in the prison. The contract was actually developed by the warden, who was also the warden at the Women's Community Correctional Center when I was there. So, so he asked me, Pat, can you come in and take a look? Because we are especially interested in the disparate number of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders in HYCF. And so I did the left side because that's the evidence-based practice. <clears throat> 
but we needed to see well but what other perspective might we use because there is more one source of knowledge uh there's more than one school that develops a source of knowledge and so um because of the disparate number of native hawaiians we could use now research tools as such as kukuluku muhana to at, at, to use as a lens to look at who is in the prison. So it's not only the, the criminological, developmental science, neuroscience perspective, but we can also now provide a second source of uh, in perspective in terms of understanding who's in the prison. And in the last 10 years, there's been a tremendous amount of work by Native Hawaiian organizations, Native Hawaiian scholars, um, uh, to understand better um, Native Hawaiian well-being, a strength-based perspective, gift-based perspective, that gives a totally different picture of, of who is in the facility, how did they get there, and what can we do in terms of programming to help them successfully transition back into the community. And so having perspective, having evidence-based practices, and I say evidence-based meaning from a Native Hawaiian perspective of experience, Native intelligence, Native knowledge, how can we use that perspective to assess the youth that are there? And so we can now provide not just a, uh, a Western-based approach, but we can now provide you know, a Native Hawaiian indigenous-based approach to understanding who is in there. And we can then have um, make recommendations that are, uh, are really more appropriate for the folks who actually are in there. And Mikiala's example again is a is, story is a great example of of how native practices uh, uh, healing practices um, can be applied uh, for our population um, okay so can can I see the next slide so just as an ex so just to show you what what it looks like when you apply two different, culturally different perspectives. So in that psychosocial evaluation, you can see the details of uh, the types of information that is collected. They're primarily medic uh, a medical model-based um, uh, evaluation uh, you, from a biological, psychological, social uh, perspective, risk and protective factors, um, that 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 would be the typical Western-based approach, as compared to applying Kukulu Kumuhana's six dimensions of well-being, and how might this um, perspective, this model, help us to think about the youth who are in the prison? And so, as Antipua would always say, well. We need to tell the whole story about who the youth are and what happened to them. And so by looking at each of these dimensions, it helps us to start to think about, well, if we are to tell the whole story from a, from a perspective that represents their background, their practices, their beliefs, their values, then Kukulukumohana helps us to then be able to find or, or think about what else do we need to understand about the youth. And the biggest challenge is that we don't collect that information in the files of the youth that they send to the youth correctional facility. So it, while they're it does help in terms of um, understanding what data is missing. There are some information that we can utilize for 
dimensions of well-being, but it is also very helpful to say, all right, well, on the other hand, what are the strengths that we need to develop? What are the types of programs that are that we could create uh, that would help them do, uh, um, increase their well-being? And how do we measure that uh, using, in this case, we now have the six dimensions of well-being from, you know, through Kukulukumohana. So it enables us to, put, to apply a different perspective, a different framework in understanding these youth who have experienced challenges and, <clears throat> and have not adapted or didn't have the support to adapt to the challenges that have, they have experienced in their lifetime. So that's from a research pers perspective, we can now say that we have evidence-based practices that describe Native Hawaiian concept of well-being. And I, can you show me the next slide, Brandon? Okay, sorry. Okay, so they, there, um, there are now multiple studies available. And now when we can, when we write our report, we can reference in a lit review all of the different studies that have looked at Native Hawaiian well-being, what that what is represented in that idea and why that would be effective. The more programs that we can evaluate to show the effectiveness of increasing areas of well-being as identified by Kukulu Kumohana, uh, the more effective will be our applications for grants for developing programs uh, that are impactful in a positive way. So how could we do that in, a pro in, in programs? So, I, so the next part would be, well, if we do have programs that um, uh, are designed to improve the well-being of individuals, then how do we do that? And so um, I'm a program evaluator for uh, a family intervention uh, developed by Hui Maliola, um, based on, a lot on the research from Kamehameha schools. Um, uh, when they looked at uh, comparing culture-based educational programs compared to standard educational programs provided by the DOE. And the evidence is um, well supported that uh, Native Hawaiian, not just Native Hawaiian students, but all students in general who were uh, provided um, as part of their education, culture-based uh, programs and classes that they actually outperformed um, uh, students who were in our standard classrooms. And so with using that model, Hui Maliola developed a family program that during the COVID period of time, when students, most of our students were staying at home, uh, that they were experiencing higher levels of stress from the student level in terms of keeping up with the lessons and the family level in terms of uh, providing care and, and supervision and support, especially to their children during COVID. So this program, uh, proposed that if we um, provided a program that taught families, including parents and children, important uh, cultural practices and values that like culture-based educational programs, culture-based healing programs would have a very positive effect in helping families to uh, be, remain resilient, and to manage uh, the stressors that come up because of uh, how COVID is affecting our normal um, lives. And so uh, what the program provided uh, were um, uh, sessions taught by Kumu uh, on Native Hawaiian practices, uh, including healing practices, including um, uh, la'olapa'au, lomi-lomi, and ho'oponopono. And 
and also emphasize uh, strengthening the language of uh, the family and the youth. And so <clears throat> what we, how we applied, what Kukulu Kumuhana provided us was a way to evaluate the impact of the program. And so like the culture-based education program, uh, the, the, the concept or the theory was that by providing um, knowledge and skills of traditional Native Hawaiian healing practices, that we would increase the resiliency in the family to manage stress, uh, which included um, parents being more supportive of their children, children being able to manage their own stresses, both in the at home and at school and in the community. And that um, we would see um, this resiliency, uh, these positive outcomes by looking at those dimensions of kukulu kumuhana and to see if at, as a result of the intervention that these areas, these dimensions of kukulu kumuhana have been impacted in a positive wow. way. So one of the examples uh, in how do we do that was oh, one of the examples is uh, in, in our um, post survey to see what was the impact of the program. One of the items asked in that e column evaluation survey item, please describe the activity or experience from this program that had the most positive impact on you. What was it about this activity or experience that contributed most to the impact you experienced? One of the per participants' responses, which was pretty typical, was that, and this is from a youth, my thoughts about this program is that I learned so much about Hawaiian culture and the practices they did on our kupuna. What I liked the most is how we got to make a pilina with my mom while working on her. He was doing lomi lomi on his mom. And so we then had, using this coding process of the different dimensions, the uh, Native Hawaiian program project staff then you looked at the participant response and coded to what extent were any of these dimensions represented in that uh, comment by the student. And so in this, in this response, um, the coders felt that Pilina and Oivi were represented in that participant's response. And so what what it really allows us to do is to be able to, uh, to look in terms of what is the impact of the program on the well being of the participants. And by having Kukulu Kumuhana uh, and their six dimensions as areas of well being, we can then see to what extent and which dimensions have been impacted by the program. And it, what was also interesting was the responses from the youth or the children in the family compared to the responses of the parents. Uh, and of course, they're slightly different how children um, responded to the activities uh, as well as the parents. Uh, and so we have Kukuluku Mahana data uh, for both youth and how youth responded uh, in terms of improving their well-being through a program aimed at teaching them Hawaiian healing practices and how parents responded. And it helps us then to, first of all, verify the positive impact of the program. And it helps us to be more specific that it impacted the program using Kukuluku Muzana's dimensions. It impacted the participants in these particular ways. And so, um, again, from a research perspective, uh, we can be more um, rigorous in terms of how we analyze the data. And we can then have data that we can share with other organizations uh, who are also interested in providing culture-based practices. Um, and we can then share, if they use the same type of coding, we can then share our information with other programs aggregate the data, and we start to develop a database 
to provide an evidence base for programs that are culture-based, provide traditional healing practices, Native Hawaiian healing practices, and that we can share what we did in order to uh, achieve that outcome. So those are two examples. One from a research perspective, how do we uh, use uh, Kukulu Kumuhana as a different cultural lens in evaluating and understanding uh, a population that has experienced serious uh, behavioral and social problems. And we have a program evaluation. How, how can we use Kukulu Kumuhana to evaluate the impact of uh, programs that provide uh, Native Hawaiian healing practices, um, especially in this case with families in a stressful situation. Wow, well, mahalo, Patrick. God, time flies when you're having fun. Um, yeah. I know we're really close to, close to it. I just quickly want to say that, um, you know, I mentioned before, there's a lot of people that have been part of this work. This is the first time the four of us have presented. And just personally, I learned a lot from, from Mickey, from Paula, from Patrick. Um, and, and, I, and I think that's part of the cool thing that, you know, you can kind of repackage this, you can bring different people together and you'll always come up with some kind of a, a different learning or different takeaway. So the idea was to show you some examples, like, you know, what is this, you know, what if you approach well-being from a culturally grounded community-based framework? Like how did that maybe stretch our thinking or affirm our thinking? And then what does it look like, you know, in education, in a classroom or a program, or if you're trying to evaluate or, um, or, or do it from a research lens. So they were just meant to give you ideas. And, and I know there's a lot of different people on the call and hopefully your gears are spinning with how you would apply this. Um, but thank you so much for the time. We do have a little bit for questions, but I'll turn it back to Gail and Bella who have been such wonderful hosts for us. Um, yeah, thank you for this time. Oh, thank you, all of you. That was amazing. What a gift to our community, from our community to our community. What an amazing gift. So if anybody would like to unmute and ask any questions, you can uh, share it out or put it in the chat. Either way, please do so. We would love to hear from you. Any thoughts? I see a lot of mahalo coming through from everyone. Great presentation. I think it was really appreciated. Bella and I are using this regularly um, for in our trauma-informed trainings with schools. So we're hoping to share this out even more. And I just heard somebody come on. Sorry, that was me again. Wally, is that Wally? Is that you? Yeah, that's me. Go yeah. ahead, Wally. So my question is to uh, Mickey Ala. Uh, could you tell uh, tell me a little bit more about your program? It sounds like you have an after school program out there. Yeah, we um we grow rooted and engage communities through out of school and community programs. So we have been after school programs. So anytime school is not in session, we're running programs with youth. And then we do community programs at our site pool Kapolei, where we have uh, monthly work days there. Is Uncle Shad still out there at Pu'u Kapolei? Yes, he is. Well, not at Pu'u Kapolei. You know, the vandalism and crime has been so heavy. It's been a it's been a challenge for our kupuna. It really breaks their hearts. So we've stepped in, and um, they don't come around as much. Uh, but he's still involved very much with the Kailua Heritage Park. And still with the community as well. Thanks for asking about him. He is a he is a hulu kupuna in this area. So, is so is it a nonprofit or do parents do people pay for this program or how does that work? Yep, we're a nonprofit, and uh, parents do pay. We keep our registration fees minimal. It's not really to pay for the programming, but more to uh, ensure attendance. What are the hours of this program? So our, our after school program, we actually pick up students after school at their schools and we bring them to our learning center. So it's as soon as school ends, we pick them up and we take them to our learning center in Kalailoa. So from about two o'clock till six o'clock every every day. Wow. And then so our intercessions, I'm sorry, our intercessions are 10 hours a day from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. So you have um, transportation like vans? Yep. That, wow. Yeah, we have two we have two 15 passenger vans. 
So how many how many students do you uh, have participating? We serve about 240 students per year through our wow. out of school programs and then our community programs at Pu'ul Kapolei, we have about 300 to 400 volunteers that come out for our work days. That's awesome. Awesome work you're doing out there. Oh, mahalo nui. Mahalo. I think it's our time. We just want to thank our presenters again, Patrick, Brandon, Nikiala, and Paula. Thank you so much for this presentation. What a gift to all of us. And thank you all for joining us. We'll be having um, another, uh, our next speaker series will be on November 15th. And we will be talking about the book Nana Ike Kumu on the third edition. So we look forward to all of seeing all of you soon next month. Thank you again. Mahalo. Mahalo Nui, everybody. Thank Mahalo. you so much. Aloha. Aloha.